I see that in resentful men all the time. They're very antipathetic towards women and they blame their misery and resentment on the fact that women won't have anything to do with them while the women are making them self-conscious for not being all they should be because the women think, why should I bother with you if you're not the embodiment of the spirit that will move into the unknown and face the Leviathan, which is exactly what she should be saying. And you're thinking, I don't want to have anything to do with that, but I'd like women to like me anyways. Good luck with that. So that doesn't work out. There's very little difference between self-consciousness and shame. In fact, if you do psychometric analysis of the state of self-consciousness, it loads with neuroticism. So it loads with anxiety and emotional pain. What does it mean to become self-conscious? One way of thinking about it is you become aware of your vulnerability or another is that you become aware of your insufficiency. Okay, so let's say that you're standing up in front of a crowd talking and you become self-conscious. What happens? First of all, you can't talk anymore. The second is you kind of fall inside. The third is you feel ashamed. And the fourth is that you retreat and you look down. So it's a low status operation and it's associated with heightened anxiety and so then you might say well why would you become self-conscious before a crowd well the answer is they can see you and they can judge you and you can make an error in front of them and you can make a fool of yourself so they put you down you can display yourself in a manner that ratchets you down the dominance hierarchy that's to become self-conscious what would you want to be king you could say king of the world or king of your own soul what do you want to subordinate yourself to How about your heroic willingness to encounter the unknown and articulate it and share that with people? There's no nobler vision than that. And I don't see that it's merely arbitrary. And it's not merely arbitrary too, because if you do that, to the degree that you do that, assuming your society isn't entirely corrupt, you will be successful. It will actually aid you practically. You'll rise up above men. You'll be selected by women. You'll be admirable. You'll be valued. Who's more self-conscious, women or men? And the answer to that is women are more self-conscious than men. And even further, you might say that women taught men to be self-conscious. And I believe that to be the case. Maybe babies taught women to be self-conscious, but women taught men to be self-conscious and they still teach them that all the time because there's nothing that makes a man more self-conscious than to be rejected by a woman that he desires. So the woman is always offering self-consciousness to men and it isn't necessarily a gift that they exactly appreciate it. And the problem again for men with being allied with women and infants is that it also heightens their self-consciousness because you're a lot tougher and more indomitable, say if there's just you, but as soon as you have a wife, say, and then you also have an infant, well, all the burden of their self-consciousness and their vulnerability is placed upon you. Well, it's a hell of a bargain. Half our brain is devoted to visual processing. So as well, as long as our eyes got better, our brain got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. What happens when it gets big enough? Well, not only can you see, you can meta-see. It's you can start to see into the future. Well, that's exactly what happened to us. Not only could we see with our eyes, we could see with our imagination. Close your eyes, bring up a vision. You can imagine the future. What are you seeing? You're seeing a potential future with your eyes closed. The circuitry's there. Once it's developed, you can use it to imagine. You can pro- project your project your vision into places that don't even exist. And you can start to conceptualize the future. It isn't just the present anymore. I don't have to just worry about whether or not I'm hungry right now. I'm going to have to worry about whether I'm hungry tomorrow and next week and next month and next year and for me and for my wife and for my child and for the community. It's like you can forget about your day-to-day existence in paradise at that point. That's good because we don't die and we live maybe 30 years longer and we have fewer horrible diseases and all of that, but that doesn't mean it's any picnic. You have to carry that along with you wherever you go. That's the burden of self-consciousness. Every social animal and even many animals who aren't social are embedded in a dominance hierarchy. The dominance hierarchy has a structure. We couldn't call it a dominance hierarchy. Dominance hierarchy A, B, C, D, E, thousands of them across thousands of years. You extract out from all of them what's central to all of them. That's the pyramid of value. What question do you need answered about the pyramid of value? What's at the top? Because that's the ideal. The dominance hierarchy has been around for 350 million years. It's a long time. You don't get to just brush that off and say, well, morality is some sort of second order cognitive problem. No, it's not. I I can tell you something about its instantiation in your nervous system. You have a counter 
at the bottom of your brain that keeps track of where you are in terms of your status. And it bloody well regulates the sensitivity of your emotions. So if you're at the bottom of the hierarchy, barely clinging on to the world, everything overwhelms you. And that's because you're damn near dead. And so everything should overwhelm you. You've got no extra resources. Any more threat, you're sunk. So you become extremely sensitive to negative emotion and maybe also impulsive so that you grab while the grabbing is good. And if you're nearer the top in the dominance hierarchy and your counter tells you that, then your serotonin levels go up, you're less sensitive to negative emotion, you're less impulsive, you live longer, like everything works in your favor. Your immune system functions better and you're oriented at least to some degree towards the medium and long-term future. And you can afford that because all hell isn't breaking loose around you all the time. And so then the question, is there a way of being that increases the probability that you're going to move up dominance hierarchies? Well, that doesn't seem to be a particularly provocative proposition, unless you think that it's completely arbitrary and random. What constitutes acceptable power? What constitutes acceptable sovereignty? Who should lead? Who should rule? What should be at the top? The Mesopotamians figured that out. Speech and vision, that's Marduk. Speech, vision, and the willingness to confront the terrible unknown. That's what should rule. What, is that an arbitrary idea, or is that a great idea? How could it be any other way? That's what human beings are like. And I don't think that you can read the Mesopotamian story and understand the reference, which isn't an easy thing to do, and fail to draw that conclusion. Marduk has eyes all the way around his head. He speaks magic words. He goes off to fight Tiamat, the dragon of chaos. What's that? That's the reptilian predator that lurks in the unknown. Is any of that, is, it, does it, is there anything about any of that stands in opposition to what you were, would presume if you were just analyzing our situation from a purely biological perspective? We're prey animals, we're predators. We've been threatened by reptiles forever. Why wouldn't we use the predator that lurks in the dark forest or the water as a representative of the unknown? Why wouldn't we harness that circuitry? We already have it at hand. And even more to the point, how could we do anything else? It makes perfect sense.